Still in First John. I like saying that, actually. I like, I like saying that. Still in First John. Oh, it's fun to say that, you know? Still in First John. All right, last... Was it last week? It was last week. We were here last week. Yeah, we were here last week. We were here last week. <laughs> the weather's been so crazy. I can't remember whether or not we've been here last week or not. But apparently we were. There's a vast majority who makes the claim that we were here. So I'm going with that. I was here. <laughs> it feels like last week was Christmas. How about that? Merry Christmas. Okay, I think, am I right? That we got to, did we get to verse 16? Yes, you did. Oh, did we? Yes. Okay. We, were, we ended, we were going to start on verse 17. Yeah. That's what I figured. We got two verses left on this page. We got oh, That's right. It does sound right, right? Because we're talking about imitating Christ, Christ laying down his life. And um, that being a display of love, the true love. And that's how we know love. All right, so starting in verse 17, this is a continuation on the whole idea of love being a verb. Love, love being an action. Love being in action. Not in action, but love being something that is done, something that we do. So starting in verse 17 of 1 John chapter 3, if anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? What do you think of that? exclusive statement, isn't it? And, I, and when I say exclusive, I mean this statement pertains to only a certain group of people. I mean, it's not for everybody. The literal translation is brothers or sisters. But in context, we're talking about followers of Christ here. If you, as a follower of Christ, know God's love, and you know a follower of Christ who is without, and you have plenty, and you withhold, how can you make this claim that God's love abides in you? Right? How can you make a claim that you're a follower of Christ? Exactly. And, and so many other things can be said about that. How can you make the claim that you're a follower of Christ? How can you make the claim that God's love abides in you? How can you make the claim that you love your neighbor? How can you make the claim of all these different things if your verbs don't follow through? Right? Now, one of the things that I really want to make clear is... It's not telling you, nowhere in this statement does it tell you that you have to put yourself in jeopardy on behalf of someone else's. It's saying, if you have, if you have and you see someone who doesn't, and you withhold some of what you have, okay? It doesn't say give them everything you have, so then have nothing, and then expect someone else to come along and give to you. We're talking about prosperity. Someone who is prosperous, someone who does have. But it does make you think about exactly how much do I need to have enough. Amen. 
Exactly. How well are you living? How are you living your life? Right? So, so therein lies that area where you are allowed to make your own judgment. To make your own determination as to what you have to offer someone else. But it does say, very clearly, brother or sister, fellow believer, another follower in Christ. You can phrase it however you want. Well, and clearly God expects us to, so I wouldn't want to face God and him go, well, how come you didn't help your brother and you're like, well, you know, I couldn't afford it, and him going. Really? Did you need that Maserati in your <laughs> driveway with your four-car garage? <laughs> Yeah. Did you really need those things? Do those things really become a necessity to you? So does that mean you have to do it every day for the same person? No. No. Mm -hmm. No. Because what we're finding here and okay, this is this is kind of one of those areas. You can't look into the heart of someone and see whether or not they are a follower of Christ in their heart. But you can see what they do. You can see how they behave. You can see how they act. You can see what it is that their life is directed towards. You can see their behavior. You can see this in others. You can tell. By the fruits. By the fruits you shall know them, right? Right? Okay? So the question is, is do you got to do it over and over and over for the same person? Jesus said seven times seventy. So if they need something every day, every month. What do they need? What do you have? What do they have to what do you have to offer? Okay? Because sometimes, and see this is one of those areas, right? Where you, you've you've got people who are a parent of a wayward believer. And this parent wants to help their child. And they know that if I just give them money, it's not going to help them. It's not going to help them get right with God. I know they know who Jesus is. I know because I took them to church. I know because we sang Jesus Loves Me together. I know because I was there with them when they walked the aisle and professed faith in Christ. I, was, I know because I was there when they were baptized. I know because I've lived with them for 17 years and raised them. But now they're not living like they're supposed to. They're not living like Scripture tells them they should be living. And now they're in need. What are they in need of? Nine times out of ten, they're in need of this. And we've got plenty to give away. We've got plenty to give away. Nine times out of ten, <coughs> Scripture is what they need more than anything in the world to get their lives straight. Sometimes you may just need to give them a comforting ear. You may not have the material things that they need. Sometimes you just need to pray for them. Sometimes all you can do is pray for them. If they, it doesn't say what kind of need. Now it does say that if you have the world's goods and you withhold compassion, charity, generosity, right? How can you make a claim? I mean, this is this is still one of those areas where, look. This is talking about a believer. This is talking about somebody who is following Christ faithfully. Right? There are other places that talk about helping the... Absolutely. Other places in Scripture that talk about being generous to those in need, being charitable to people who are not brothers and sisters in Christ. As a testimony. As a testimony of God's love. And that's, that's not what not we're talking this. about. That is not this. 
what John is writing about here, specifically, is referring to Jesus talking about one of my own. What If you didn't do for my own, how can you claim to be a follower of me? Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked him, do you love me? Of course I do. Of course, of course I do. Then what? Feed my sheep. Well, and we've experienced this in more wealthier churches where, you know, the, for example, one of the needs that you had was you needed a job, and <laughs> there wasn't any, even within the church, it was like, well, what have you done wrong? And it was, it was not this attitude. It was, a, well, you must have done something to be in your situation, so I'm not going to help you. And, that, and that's what he's referring to there. And it wasn't that you were looking for a handout. It was it was actually walking alongside each other and making sure that nobody is in need is really the best word. It, you know, it is. In, in need of, of whatever it is. Sure. So. But I, I tend to go along with the, the reading of this that it's not solely material need. Right. Not solely. I mean, if you if you read this and look at it and say, "Oh, this is just talking about stuff." It's also talking so about my my fellow my fellow believer doesn't have a television. I have two. I need to give them one. How does that help? They don't. They've been out of work. Their, their kids don't have shoes. Right. The refrigerator's half empty. They don't have a TV, but I have two, so I'm going to give them a TV. That's that's what the Bible says to do. Right? But it's also not in talking about material stuff, too. It's, it's, a, it's With, withholding compassion. Now, that, that word compassion is an interesting word, too, because there's so much surrounding our display, our display of compassion, <laughs> the kind of compassion that Christ has toward the people. Right? There's so much involved in that. Counsel, love, encouragement, exhortation, prayer. There's just so much. A meal. How much of this cannot be met if you don't know somebody? So it's really emphasizing that sharing life together. Yeah, that's another no, that's another part of it. But too. you can't yeah. help somebody if, if you don't know. If you don't know what they, they need help. Yeah, and so that's another reason why we are encouraged to fellowship with one another. This is this is picturing people in a church that are fellowshipping with one another, growing and walking alongside one another in Christ, sharing with one another the intimacies of their spiritual lives. The, the wonders of it, the blessings of it, as well as the difficulties and the trials of it. <coughs> John's writing this after the destruction of Jerusalem. A persecuted church. Right? You had this class disparity that's so great among the church. And John does not tell them, well, you know, if one of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, one of your fellow believers, has nothing, is without, is in need, find out what they're doing wrong and you know, but find out if they're right with God. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. But it does emphasize, and, and this has got to be made clear, this passage does emphasize the responsibility that we have towards one another. And the one another is the brothers and sisters of Christ. Our responsibility towards one another. John is elevating that above just the general charitable works that goes on. 
Well, okay. and that gets noticed. When, this past weekend, um, one of the ladies there told a story about how they had just adopted a brother and a sister, and then they get this call in the middle of the night from their adoption board and says, well, you know that mother of those two kids that you just adopted? She just had another one. Do you want the baby? And they're like, uh, well, uh, yes, you know, and they're like, well, you know, it's going to be $40,000. And they went, oh, well, you know, and, and they need it tonight. Uh, well, we don't have that. And they're like, well, we thought that would be the answer, so we're going to waive our fee. That makes it $17,000. Will you be able to get that? And they're like, well, you know, God, God told us to take care of this lady's kids, so we'll find a way. They walked into that hospital later that night for $17,000, and the lawyer was like, how is this even possible? And they were able to witness to the lawyers and to the mother and to the doctors because the church got together and met their need. Brother and sister in Christ, in need. Great example. It's a great example. Not only does John tell us that, but like 40 years earlier, James says the same thing. In James chapter 2, starting in verse 15, it's on your handout. If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? What good is it? What have you just done? What, what kind of ministry is that to a brother and sister? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. James is not telling us that we got to have works to have salvation. Our salvation comes through faith, which results in action. Our faith leads us to knowing love, the love of God, the love of Christ, the love that... <coughs> is unmatched in every possible way. And that love brims to overflowing so that it is demonstrated, right? The work we do is the work God does in us. And that's what James and John are saying. Paul says similar things as well. I actually had, uh, it was James and John and Peter and Jesus all saying the same thing regarding the, the work of a believer. The things that we do. And when you have John, Paul, Peter, James and Jesus all telling you, look, you can't just be a professed follower of Christ and nothing more. You can't just say it. You can't just claim it. You have to live it. You have to act on it. You have to do it. Jesus says, pick up your cross. Jesus says, well, sell off everything you have and follow me. Right? Sell off your attachments. Get rid of your... Get rid of your idols and follow me. Don't cling to this earth and follow me. You can't cling to the things of this world and follow Jesus. Right? So when we are followers of Jesus, when we are doing the things that demonstrate his love for us to others, we're just useful tools in the hands of God that show that love to other people. But even more so, if a brother or sister now, I mean, this is this is where it gets even more escalatory, right? If 
a brother or sister is in need. And we're like, oh, well, I'll, I'll pray for you. Go be warm. Yeah, I know they turned your heat off, but go be warm. You know, yeah, I know your refrigerator's empty, but go be well fed. What are we doing? If we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ, followers, people who you associate and fellowship regularly, that you pray with, that you read scripture with, and even if you don't have the material needs that they have, well, hey, you know what? I, I know. Give me a minute. Let me make a phone call. Let me see what I can find out for you. Let me help you. Noisy dog. Clamoring symbol. Yeah. You know, we all have networks. Yeah. You know, each of us sitting at this table, or that table over there, have networks where we have access to various services and people that we can meet the needs that may have different resources available to them, different groups available, different outlets. That's, that's absolutely correct. You know, he wants us to take our talents and use them for his purposes. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and James is saying here, if you don't give them what the body needs, what, what good is it? That it doesn't mean you've got to go without yourself. That needs to be very clear. Because nowhere in Scripture does it say that you need to put yourself or your family in jeopardy for the sake of someone else. Doesn't say that. Can't find it. Okay? But it does say that when we're talking about a fellow follower of Christ... We're responsible for how we act towards them. And I, I threw this in here, 1 John 2, 5. We've gone through it before, but I threw this in here for a, something us to think about, right? Whoever keeps his word truly in him, the love of God is made complete. Okay, that's, that's neat, but... You know, and we're already in First John. Let's just flip back and see what the context is of this verse, right? Context is, is this is following God's commands. This is all about God's commands to us. We start in verse three. It says, "This is how we know that we know Him if we keep His commands." The one who says, "I've come to know Him," and yet doesn't keep His commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I want to stop there. Okay? Because this is a good question for us to pose to that person who's continually needy. Because we're supposed to be. I mean, John says, verse 17, chapter 3, brother or sister, a fellow believer. Okay? <coughs> The one who says, I have come to know him, the one who says, I am a fellow believer, I am a follower of Christ, but doesn't keep God's commands. Aha! Right? We can see where, we can see people keeping commands. Right? We can see it. Right? I mean, that's something that's observable. God's, God's, keeping God's commands are observable behaviors. Observable actions that we're able to. Right? If they're not keeping God's commands, they're a liar. Very simple. Not difficult. Like we were talking earlier, 
I can be a self-professed Christian and have absolutely nothing to do with Scripture Christianity. Scripture following Christ. And if we're not doing God's commands, what does, what does Jesus say God's commands are? Hey, they're simple. There's two of them. What's the greatest command? Jesus is asked. What's the greatest command? Right? Love God. God is one. Hero Israel. Shema Israel. Right? Hero Israel. God, your God. Lord God is one. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And love one another, just as you love yourself. That's that's it, right? Are they showing that love? Are they showing God's love in their lifestyles? God's own word tells us that we should not forsake the coming together of one another. If you're not going to church... You might want to reevaluate how you're following God's commands. If you're not fellowshipping with fellow believers, that's a church. I'm not saying you got to build a building, put a cross on the top, a baptistry in it. No, you don't have to do that. Right? Are you fellowshipping with fellow believers, praying, praising, reading the scriptures together? If you're not doing those things, you may want to reevaluate your relationship with God. And we then shall reevaluate our compassion towards that person. That person needs the scripture more than they need $10 to go and get a pack of cigarettes. Right? You know what I'm talking about because it's happened. It's, oh yeah, man, I, I just don't have time to get to church. I can't, can't do that. You know, it's really hard for me. You know, I got all these other things going on. And, you know, I just need 10 bucks, man, to make it till next week. And excuses. Excuses, excuses. Well, you know, why don't you come to church with me? Oh, you know, I believe in the Bible and all that stuff. I just don't need to go to church. Really? How can you fellowship if you don't go to church? We've had people ask us for food, and then we would invite them over for dinner, and they're like, oh, no, yeah. I, can't, yeah. I can't make it. Yeah. When I worked in Gatlinburg, people would walk up to me on the main strip. Hey, you got any money? You got any money? I need to get something to eat. Come on in. I'll get you something to eat. Oh, that's cool. I'll go. I'll oh, go. that's okay. That's okay. Oh, you're homeless? I see you're standing out here on the corner with this sign that says you're homeless. Get in. I'll take you to a place where you can get shelter, food, yeah. clothing, blankets, a bed. No, 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 man. I don't need that. Oh, really? It's sign says you do. <laughs> I've had people ask for money so they go to a restaurant and they were homeless. I told them where they, where they go eat for free. And they're like, no, no, I want to eat there. And it's like, yeah. And I just right? walked, I walked away because they were only like three blocks away from a shelter that served food. Exactly. Exactly. Right? So, I mean, we, we've got a standard. John gives us a standard with which to see God's love in action and then make the determination. I mean, we're, so, we're not supposed to be gullible, passive, you know, doormat Christians who get walked on by everybody. That, that's not our role. That's not what we're called to. We're called to be thoughtful, rational, discerning. stewards of what God has given us, discerning, okay? And... The Word gives us direction. And so most of the time, most of the time, what they need is help. Not necessarily the help they want, but the help that Jesus offers. That, the help that gets them in the right direction, right? Now, I'm not going to take you there, right? I'm not going to say, wow, you know, I'm, I'm a multi-billionaire. I'm CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and, you know, I'm just, I see you're in need. I'm just going to buy you a house. I'm going to pay your taxes for you. I'm going to get you a car. I'm going to fill your refrigerator every week. You know, I've got a few people I'll hire for you to take care of your stuff. So you can just keep doing nothing. 
and live in disobedience to God. And to live in disobedience to God, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. If you love somebody, you won't do that. Well, if God's love doesn't enable that kind of behavior. Because God is a corrective God. There's examples all throughout Scripture of God correcting his children. Right? You notice he talks to us as children. And as adults, if we look at children and the choices that they make, we can see clearly wrong decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if we continue on in chapter 2, verse 5, right? We read how they're not supposed to be, but, it, it, but whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Their lives should be a reflection of Christ. Their lives should be a reflection <coughs> of Christ. This is how we know. John has given us the tools to make that determination. Their life should be a reflection of Christ. A brother and sister, a fellow believer, should be reflecting the life of Christ in what they do, in how they live, in how they love, in how they act. It's very easy for us to make this determination. We've got the tools in Scripture to do so. Right? And having those tools, we then know how to act on them. If that person's not living like they're a reflection of Christ, we know what they need. We know what they need. They need Jesus. They need scripture. They need prayer. They need to talk to somebody about their relationship with God. Right? It's very simple. We're, we're not called to be doormats. We're called to be welcoming mats for Christ. And there's a difference. There's a big difference. I'm afraid to go in, into the next verse. No. Oh. You know, I don't, if we go into the next verse, we're, I know we're going to run over. And I just know we are. Well, let's just save it. We should save it. We should save it. We got through a verse tonight. So we're in verse 18. Maybe in verse 18 next week. Maybe we did the happy dance. No, we did that earlier tonight. We did the happy dance earlier. Right? Anything, any other questions or comments or observations over this? Is it, I mean, it is a point of, a lot of people can twist this passage and do. They twist it for their own ends. Because they're going to say to you, hey, now doesn't the Bible say you're supposed to give me what I want? Well, that's the thing. Showing love to an unbeliever and showing love to a believer are two different things, but they both give a witness and a testimony, but in different ways. When we love on each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, it shows the world what that kind of a relationship is. It's a reflection of our relationship with God. That's absolutely right. But if we keep a line separated from unbelievers and believers, sometimes we're going to be able to experience that. So loving unbelievers is a way for them to have that experience. And, and I, you bring something up really important. I don't want us to walk away from this thinking that we're, we're not called to be charitable to unbelievers. We're not called to be witnesses in love, in action, to unbelievers. I don't want us to walk away with that assumption. But they do two different things. They're two different things. They're two separate things. And 
one of the wonderful things about when believers do fellowship and cooperatively help other people, it's easier to do. It's easier for this large group of people to reach out and help a family in need that isn't followers of Christ so that they come to know who Christ is. Right? And that's a little bit different story. That's a, that's a little bit different tactic, if you will, in charity. But I don't want us to walk away from this thinking that we're not allowed to be charitable to people who are unbelievers. Because Jesus met physical needs and then he met spiritual needs. Jesus healed the blind and then told them to go and sin no more. Right? Jesus cast out demons and then said, God did this. Make sure you let everybody know that this is God, the work of God. Right? Jesus fed the 5,000 men. we got to keep that in mind. There were, there were only 5,000 men, but we don't know how many women and children were there. But he it fed could have been 10,000 people. It could have been easily 10,000 people. But he fed them. It could have been more, but he fed them. And they had leftovers, and he gave them the truth. Right? So, so it's not that we're not supposed to meet the physical needs of people. I don't want that to be what we get away from this, because that's not the case. But there are different methods of meeting those needs, and how we meet those needs, and how we approach the believer and the unbeliever. They're like, oh, well, I didn't doubt it, but the motive was the most of the thoughts and intentions of the heart and love for the That's sharing. I know where I would at. And I know where you're at. I can sympathize. And Paul calls us to remember where it was that we were before we came to Christ. Paul tells us very clearly that we need to know what kind of life we lived and where we were, what our direction was before we came to know Christ. That that's imperative that we know that. So that then we can have compassion on the unbeliever in a way that makes sense. Because we knew what we needed. What we needed was Jesus. Right? We needed a relationship with Christ more than anything. But when we're talking about somebody who already knows Christ and is living that life, what kind of love are we showing if we say, oh, okay, that's nice, go on, about your way. I'll pray for you. They might even not do They might. So our viewers are going to go, Matthew 18. Yeah, Matthew 18. Good, good. <laughs> they all need to do that, right? That's a Matthew 18. <laughs> right? Anything else? Before we wrap this up, put a poll on. Alright. We're gonna pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all that we have that you have given to us. That you have blessed us in so many wonderful ways. And above all, you have blessed us with Christ. That we know your love through what it was that He did. And then that love then be the foundation upon which you build your church through us that we can become lights in this dark world for you that we can be proclaiming your glory and praise your name through all that you are I praise you and I thank you for this I thank you for everyone here tonight I pray that you would watch over them as they leave bring us back together so that we might continue to glorify and praise you, to read your word, and grow stronger in faith. Our spiritual walk with Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.